All right, all right. Well, we are wrapping up our series called, But Wait, There's More. Should we do that again this Sunday? That one Sunday was kind of fun, wasn't it? How we did that, we had it together. We said, but wait, there's more. Wasn't that fun? No, it wasn't, was it? Okay, I'm sorry. It's kind of annoying, wasn't it? Kind of annoying. Well, I've got a a few of these fitted. I left my iPad at home, y'all. So I'm going to do this from my phone. All right, it's a little smaller, but uh, I think it'll work. I think we'll make it work. Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray again if we can. Father, thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to come before you and worship together, to just fellowship together, Father, but now just to get into your word. And Father, we pray that you, through your spirit, will just fill this place with revelation, knowledge, and understanding that you will speak uh, personally and even intimately to each and every one of us so that as we leave today, we know we have had a word from you. And we give you praise for it all. Father, thank you for this group of people, this fellowship of believers that, that comes under this banner of, 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 of the gospel of grace. Thank you for them, Father. And, and Father, we just thank you for what you have in store. Although we don't even know what that is and how you connect dots in the future, but we know that you are a God that moves us forward, and we just thank you for it as a people. But but in every life that's here today, every life, every home, every business, every family, every job and career, every child, that you would just pour out your favor and your blessing and your protection, and we give you praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, we're talking about prayer. That prayer unction just hit me, man. Isn't that something? Don't you like like how God demonstrates in real time? There's more, but wait, there's more. And today is uh, part five. I saved it as part four, but that was a mistake. Part five is today's message. I'm going to read some scripture. We're going to look at a story, a true story that happened. This is recorded in Acts chapter 12. And there's a lot of stuff that happened in the book of Acts. You know, Acts is just one of those books where it'll just leave you in awe and wonder. And, and a lot of these names, some of these names were man-made, were man-given. Even this word Acts, you know, is it Acts of the Apostles, or as some would call it, or is it the Acts of the Holy Spirit? I don't really say, you, I don't think you could just leave it to Acts of the Apostles because there were a lot of people in the book of Acts that did some great things that weren't apostles. You know, Philip, I mean, uh, just different ones, you know. But I think you could clearly say that the book of Acts was the Acts of the Holy Spirit that was recorded as the Holy Spirit really formed the church. And they were formed on, the, on that day of Pentecost. And, and uh, of course, that was our first message in this series, but wait, there's more. What happened is, is as the church was birthed, Uh, the gospel started going out, the good news, that we're saved by grace through faith and not of our works. And it began to change a lot of lives. But with that, it began to really upset the apple cart. It began to upset the norm. You know, there was was certainly a movement, particularly among the religious, to keep things as they were. And now this gospel, this good news, is changing everything. It's changing the system. And... But, but it was also changing lives, and that was the biggest thing. It was changing lives. And so the powers to be, uh, the old guard, just didn't like it. And, and particularly that being our adversary, the enemy. And he is trying everything in his power to stop the, the, the advance of the gospel. He wanted everything he could do to stop it. Listen, he's still trying to do that to this day. That, that, that desire of him to stop the gospel has never stopped. And what we see then in the, in the earliest stages of the church, I mean, he came on full force. I watched a video that David Jones shared with me. I watched it earlier this morning. This pastor had some really, he believes, some prophetic dreams. Just a regular pastor of a small church in Kentucky. And he made a little video and put it out. And it's kind of gone viral. But, but in this dream, he saw the church and particularly ministers of the gospel coming under greater persecution in these last days. And it's already happening. I mean, I, I, we're just, we live in a time right now that I remember people talking about when I was a kid and thinking to myself, that, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't picture it. And a day when, listen, when we're in such a place where right is wrong and wrong is right, and if you say right is wrong and wrong is right, if you say it, you're in trouble. 
And, and that's interesting. And, and there's no telling where that's going to go. I just know, though, that, listen, as the church of Jesus Christ, we walk in power. We have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to fear in Jesus' name. Uh, I think, was it Paul that said, what can man do to me? You know, man can't do anything to me. You know, one verse says, hey, you should be more concerned about the one that can damn your soul and not just kill your body, you know. And that's our Heavenly Father. So he's on our side. He's on our side. But then the church faced greater persecution than, 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 than we've seen. There are places around the world, though, even to this day, that just for being a Christian and professing your faith still today, people can come under great persecution, imprisonment, even lose their lives. But, but we see where all that got started, and it got started right here at the very beginning of Acts when the enemy just unleashed on the church. And stuff started happening, and the church started going in, in great persecution. And as a result, the church started scattering. You know, it was, it, it, it was birthed right there in Jerusalem, but it began to spread out to, to the other parts of the earth as, as people began to scatter for being persecuted. And, and, and really what the enemy meant for evil... He really spread, he helped uh, the fulfillment of the spreading of the gospel. This is a particular account right here where Herod Agrippa, and he was such a paranoid king. He, he was so in fear of losing his throne and his power. Now he's trying to do, now it's not just the religious sect that's trying to kill and persecute the church. Now the government's doing, doing it. And Herod Agrippa issues this order and he starts arresting Christians and he arrests James. And, uh, and James is killed. So we pick it up right here. This is where we pick it up. The church is in Acts chapter 12 is now in great persecution, not just by the religious, but by the government. But by the government. Here's what it says. In verse number 1, chapter 12, it says, About that time, King Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much it pleased the Jewish people, that would be the religious, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. So it's getting really bad. James, the brother of John, has literally been executed at the hands of Agrippa, Herod Agrippa, and Herod sees that it pleases the religious, so he, he, he wanted their favor. So next thing, his next move is to arrest Peter. And what's going to happen to Peter? The same thing that just happened to James. So Peter has been arrested. Peter's been arrested. It says, verse 4, Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. So four times four, that's what, 16? So one little old Peter has 16 guards and soldiers fully equipped, fully weaponized uh, of the weapons of their day. 16 guards are guarding him. So he wants to make sure Peter doesn't go anywhere. So in prison, place him under guards, four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after Passover. And then I put in parentheses, you ready? But wait, there's more. Uh, can I do it? I'll just do it, all right? I put it right here. But wait, there's more. Now that looks pretty bad, doesn't it? But wait, there's more, you ready? But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. So he gets taken prisoner. He's in lockdown, right? More guards than, than is definitely needed to keep Peter in check, right? And as this all happens, here's what verse 5 says. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep. Fastened with two chains between two soldiers... Others stood guard at the prison gate. So he's chained to two soldiers, one on each side of him. One on each side. And then there's other soldiers out, uh, out as well. Others stood guard at the prison gate. And then I put in parentheses here. You ready? But wait, there's more. That looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Verse 7, and see, 7 is the number of perfection. Verse 7 says this. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell. Now, this isn't in my notes, but aren't you glad for some suddenlies? You ever had a suddenly happen in your life that you can go back to? I mean, it wasn't looking good. Amen? But suddenly, man, those suddenlies are powerful. Whenever you see a suddenly, just stop for a second. Amen? Read real slow. 
And listen, and thank God for the suddenlies you've had in your own life. Amen? Suddenly, just like that, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awake him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put, your san- put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought that it was a vision. He didn't realize that it was actually happening. They passed through the first set, uh, the first and the second guard post, and then came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left him. And I got in parentheses, you ready? But wait, there's more. Now that'd be enough right there, right? He was let out of prison. I mean, this is amazing. Verse 11 says this, Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent an angel and saved me from Herod and from, the, uh, and for, from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. He's talking, to, like he's like, this is not a dream, this is real. You ever had a dream that was so vivid that it just felt real? I think I had one last night. I can't remember what it was, but it seemed pretty vivid. I woke up with, you know, that, that was pretty vivid, but don't remember what it was. But this was like a dream, and, 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 but it seemed vivid. And then he's, he's fully convinced that, no, this isn't a dream. This really happened. Listen, and he's elated because he knew all too well exactly what the Jewish leaders wanted to do to him. He knew exactly what they wanted to do. And verse 12 says, When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. Now this was the group that was praying. It says, when he went into prison, the church began to pray. Now I don't know if this was the only group that was praying, but there was a prayer group at Mary's house, mother of John Mark, And they were praying. So what did he do? He goes to that house. He knocked at the door in the gate. And a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. And here's their response. Praise God. God answers prayer. Amen. Man, God still does miracles today. That's what they said, right? Nope. Here's what they said. They said, you're out of your mind. Or they said it like this. Girl, you're crazy. Right? But they said something to the effect. They said, you are out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Wow. Isn't that something? So they didn't believe. And then what they finally did believe was just so... It's like, would it have been, God, been it just as easy for God to get Peter out of prison than it would have been to send an angel that looked like Peter and sounded like him? <laughs> yeah. It was so hard. Listen to this. Now, this is interesting. It was so hard for them to believe in this moment that the prayer that they were praying in the house that God had actually answered. Isn't that interesting? They said it must be his angel. Verse 16. Meanwhile... Peter continued knocking. Can you imagine? He just sits there and he just keeps knocking. He, Peter continues knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to be quiet, to quiet down, and he told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. And he says, tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. Isn't that interesting? Five things that I want to share with you. And see, this is not going to take but a few, so we're going to be out of here in just a few minutes, all right? You ready? Number one, prayer makes a difference. Prayer makes a difference. Peter's in a tough place, and it seemed his only chance for survival is connected to prayer. Isn't that interesting? You know, we we often say this phrase, uh... Well, God's in control. And we say that. And I don't disagree with that. I know God is in control, right? But do you understand, though, that God gave the authority of this earth to mankind? And you can read it in the book of Genesis. 
He gave all authority in the earth to Adam and Eve. And he said, now you go and multiply, be fruitful and multiply. In fact, the very first assignment that Adam had as, a, as this man of authority was to name all the animals. A dog wasn't even considered anything until Adam says, you're a dog. You're a cow. And they all became living beings. They got their names and their characters all because Adam said so. Isn't that interesting? Now, why would I say that? Because we've been made in his image. We've been made in his image. And here's what he tells us. He said, and, and listen, Adam and Eve got that authority from the Father. And, and Satan, disguising himself as a serpent, stole it. He stole every bit of it. But Jesus, as a man, son of man, son of God, came back and won for us all the authority and power that Adam and Eve had stolen from him in the Garden of Eden. When Jesus won back the keys to death, hell, and the grave, he did that for you and me. And here's what he says, even at the Great Commission. He says, listen, all authority has been given to me. Now go forth into all the world and spread the gospel. Isn't that interesting? So listen, we as, as men and women... As really as human beings, but particularly as men and women of, of faith, we have a tremendous amount of authority that we've been given. And what's the best way to use that authority? What's the, what's the best way to use it? It's through your words. Proverbs says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we shall have whatever we say. Isn't that something? Life and death and the power of the tongue. He that loveth it shall eat the fruit thereof. He that loveth it, that word loveth it means to tend to it like a farmer tends a garden. He tends to it. He takes care of it. And he says like that, our words are, are that. He says our words are powerful and they're effective. And we, we, we have the ability to speak words of life. We have the ability to speak words of forgiveness. And although we could definitely say that yes, God is in control... Listen, he has given so much authority and power and control to you and to me. Now, what does that mean? That means, listen, he gives us a part to play in this thing. And he don't just do things as God walking around like the big sheriff fixing this and fixing that and doing this and doing that. You know what he does? Listen, he enlists and he invites the help and the assistance of his people. And I really see... It works best, listen, when we as God's people yield ourselves to work with him to see his will accomplished in the earth. I think it was Charles Spurgeon that says it seems as if God does no thing until his people praise. Until his people praise. Isn't that amazing? I say, so, yeah, God is in control, but listen, we have authority. We don't have to just sit around and let the devil run roughshod over us, our family, our children, and our stuff. He says, all authority in heaven. He said, you shall tread over serpents and scorpions. And he said, nothing by any means shall harm you. So what does that tell me? If we have that authority as believers, that's called the authority of the believer. And we've been given that through Jesus Christ. As, as, uh, as, 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 as the priesthood of the believer and, and, and as the authority of the believer has been given to us, listen, it matters what we say, it matters what we do, and our prayers, whether we even realize it, can be powerful. And listen, I believe oftentimes much more powerful than we even believe. Isn't that amazing? And right here we see that. It, it seems as if, listen, Peter was destined to be killed just like James. That was going to happen to Peter. There would have been no first and second Peter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If, if this had happened, right, in the, in the New Testament. Peter's life looked like it was going to end, and God intervened, but he, listen, he intervened as the church was praying. Wow. You, listen, so you could say, well, you know, hey, you know, God is in control, but you know what? Can I be honest with you? Listen, we have a part to play. We, listen, we have a part to play, and you, listen, you praying a prayer of faith can be a game changer in a situation. And it just is. It just is. One of the first things I learned after my personal encounter with the Holy Spirit, January the 13th, 1999, and, and I'm not trying to be weird when I say that, but I just didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. 
But one of the things is I opened myself up to the Holy Spirit. He began to teach me. One of the first books that I read was a book written by Kenneth Hagin called The Authority of the Believer. God began to give me download and revelation of how important my words are and that how my words can be used to bring life and death in situations. And you know what? We don't function, even the, even the, even the most aware believer of that truth doesn't walk around with a completely tame tongue. James talks about us taming our tongue. Even the, even the best of the believers don't. You know why? Because we don't walk around in the constant awareness, and I think it's almost impossible, of just how powerful our words are. We have to be, listen, we have to be careful. What does careful mean? It means you're full of care in that area. Sometimes that's a bad word. Sometimes it's a good word. We need to be careful or mindful of the words that we're releasing over situations and circumstances. Listen, and our children, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And listen, and that's no better put to use than when we pray, than when we pray. The church prayed. James 5, 16 says this. Look at this. It says, the heartfelt, and, per, and this is in the Amplified, the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, can accomplish much. When put into action and made effective by God, it is dynamic and can have tremendous power. King James Version or NIV says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person has much effect, avails much, avails much. Bottom line is this, listen, and this is not necessarily truths you've never heard, but you know what, I, there's not many, many truths I've never heard in the last 20 years. It's not the truth that I haven't heard that's keeping me from walking in victory sometimes, it's the truth I need to remember at that moment, Right? So listen, I think the Holy Spirit wants to remind us that prayer is powerful and it makes a difference. Amen? When all this craziness, I, I mean, I, man, I mean, it's crazy. And, 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 and we've been hearing this for years, the dark is going to get darker and the brighter, light are going to get brighter, right? We're the light. We're the light and the salt. We're the salt and the light. We're going to get brighter and brighter and brighter as this world gets crazier and crazier and crazier. Listen, and that means our, our prayer is even that much more important and effective. Here's the second thing we see. We see this. We see in this story that we can have peace no matter what the circumstance is. And you may be thinking, I never saw the word peace mentioned in there. Well, let me tell you what happened. Peter was sleeping. Peter was sleeping. Peter was at peace because he was sleeping. Can you imagine that? Like he already knows what's coming. There was, he, he wasn't thinking he was there just for, you know, uh, overnight like Otis Campbell would walk in and get the key and let himself in for the night, right? He knew that wasn't happening, right? He knew the only reason that he was there and had so many guards on him and around him is because they were, they were going to put him to death. But yet it's obvious that he had a peace in the middle of that storm that allowed him to sleep. I wonder who he learned that from. I wonder who he learned that from. I wonder, listen, I wonder who he saw do that. Isn't that something? I know who that was. He had seen Jesus do that in a storm. Go down into the little covering of the boat and go to sleep and take a nap. You know, and he, he saw that. So something supernaturally allowed him to have peace. And, and, and listen, if we're praying about something, if there's something weighing heavy on our heart or our mind, no matter what it is, we can pray but we can also have peace as we pray. Peace as we pray. Amen? And you know what? Peace is that resting on the fact that God is God. Father, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray in faith, but also know that you're God and you are in control, and I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to rest in you, and I'm going to be at peace. John 14, 27 says this. This is Jesus talking. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Those are the words of Jesus. And listen, he wasn't just saying that to them then. He's still saying that to us now. That no matter what goes on around us or how crazy it might get or what we may face. And, and you know what? This is, this is the hallmark of this year. If there's one word that I could use to describe 2020, you know what I feel like it is? I feel like it's the word uncertainty. It's like it's been a year of... It's like you just don't know what's coming next. It's almost like when you think 
that, that, that things are a little manageable, boom, then all of a sudden it's different. And it's like this constant, this constant thing of uncertainty. Isn't that interesting? But in all of that, all of that uncertainty, we can be certain on Him. We can, we can place our certainty on Him and we can be at peace. Psalm 23, 4, David writes this. He writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And that rod and that staff ain't for beating you. It's for protecting you from the wolves. That's what it's for. Isn't that something? That's what it's for. Here's number three. You ready? Number three. Number three. Peter got a miracle. Peter was in a tough spot. Listen, the church prayed. Peter had peace, right? And here's what we see next. Peter got a miracle. Peter, Peter got a miracle. Listen, there's great power. There's great power in prayer, and in, and in particularly the prayer of agreement. And God still answers prayer in supernatural ways. So what do we see? We saw that when Peter was in trouble, right, the church started praying. And we know of at least one home where they were meeting, and that was Mary's house. But chances are there were probably many homes as the word had gotten out and believers had huddled together and they were praying, right? And they were praying and they were agreeing. And Peter got his miracle. And there's a linkage and there's a connection, listen, to the power of prayer. And not just to the power of the prayer, but listen, the linkage to the power that believers came together and prayed with one another for breakthrough. On Peter's behalf. On Peter's behalf. Matthew 18, 19 says this. Again, truly I tell you that if two, this is Jesus talking, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. I Listen, I am quick to grab a prayer partner. I haven't always been, right? And some of you know because I've called you even at weird times, right? Odd times. Some of you in this room, I've leaned on you so hard at times in my life because I needed someone to agree with me and pray with me about something. Because there's power in agreement. There's power. In, well, listen, he, Jesus said this. He said, when any two on earth come together and agree and pray, he tells us that he hears us and that, that he's going to answer those prayers. Amen? Now, I'm not saying he's going to answer everyone just the way we want it. And listen, I thank God for that. Amen? Because there's been some times I prayed certain ways that I am thankful today that God didn't answer that prayer the way I was praying it. But yet he answered. And you know what? He always answers. He always answers. Ephesians 3.20, and I love this, and here's how he does it. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works. In us. This is Paul. And he's saying, he's saying, listen, he says, we're connected with a heavenly father that's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all, some translation said, all you could ever think, hope, ask, or imagine. That's what he can do. You got any of those in your life, in your life and in your lives? Well, you can look back over a situation that looked pretty bleak. And now you fast forward two, three, four, five, ten years, and, and listen, and you're living in the exceedingly, abundantly, and above all you can think, ask, and imagine. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. And you know what? Listen, and that's what he still does. So the next time we find ourselves in a place of need, listen, we can remind ourselves that he don't just answer. He doesn't just get me out of prison or out of that situation. He wants to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I can ask, think, hope, or imagine. That's the power of prayer. But I love this last part. Listen to this. It says, according to the power that works in us. See, there he goes again. See? He is God and he can do anything he wants, but yet for some reason he requires our input and our participation in the process. Isn't that interesting? He said he can do all these things in accordance with the power that worketh in us. And what is that power? Well, I think it starts with the Holy Spirit. 
But I think, it, I think it could just be that power, that resolve that God gives us to pray and to keep believing and to have faith that God's going to turn a situation or circumstance around. That he does all these things according to the power that works in us. I got five points and I'm on number four. I think we are going to get out of here early, y'all. I really do. Amen. Number four. Here's number four. You ready? The church was surprised when God answered their prayer. Isn't that interesting? They were shocked that God was answering their prayer. And I wrote, we must pray expecting. We must pray expecting. But I love this next part. But even though their prayers lacked much faith, God in his grace still answered. And I'm like, well, thank you, Lord. Because you know what? There are times I've had great faith when I prayed about something. And there were some times I had situations in my life where I didn't have much faith at all. And I just prayed the best way I could and the best way I knew how in that moment and in that circumstance. But even in those in situations, I can look back and I can, I can point to moments where even in spite of, still in his grace and mercy, he answered my prayers. Isn't that awesome? Listen, think about this. How much better is it, though, when we're expecting? When we're expecting. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, these are Jesus' words. He said, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, I'm so glad I didn't write that. Right? Because I know what goes off in people's minds Right after that verse, you ready? What if? Well, what about? What if? What if we just leave the what if and what about alone? And we just let God be God. And we just do what Jesus says and pray. Listen, asking whatever things we ask when we pray, believing that we receive them. You know? And I've had to say that to myself. Even when I didn't feel it, I would say, Father, I believe that I receive what I'm praying in Jesus' name. I'm just saying, listen, God in his grace and mercy has answered a many a prayer from a, from a war down beleaguered believer. But man, how much more effective, man, when we've got that, we're, we're just believing. We're believing. Amen. I thank God that he's put people in my life at times that when my faith was low, theirs was higher than mine. Amen. And I thank God for the agreement because they would join their much more faith with my little bitty faith. And God looked at it as one. Amen. And here's the last point. After all that happened, point number five, Peter left and went to another place. And here's what I got. Peter went on to tell his story. He went on to tell a story. Verse 17 in that that. That, uh, in Acts chapter 12, it says this. He motioned for them to quiet down and he told them how the Lord had, ha had, had led him out of prison. The way we know of how that moment by moment encounter happened is because Peter wrote about it. He told about it. He didn't write about it. It's not in the book of Peter. This is in the book of Acts. And Luke wrote the book of Acts. But he told about it enough. And he laid it out bit by bit, detail after detail. And it was recorded in Scripture just as Peter told. Isn't that awesome? He said, and he told them all that the Lord had done and led him out of prison. And then he says, tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. Then he went to another place. And I got a little thing after that, and it says, what's your story? What's your story? What's your story? Acts 1.8, Jesus says this. These are Jesus' words. I love it how we can just quote Jesus' words. If there's anything we ought to be able to rely on, it's Jesus' words, right? That would be the safest scripture to quote, right? Would be Jesus' words. And Jesus' words recorded in Acts 1.8, Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And what are those people telling about? Listen, what do we tell about as the Holy Spirit comes upon us and empowers us 
to be his witnesses, what do we tell about? We tell our testimony. And, and, and that sounds like such a churchy word. We don't, that's not really a word we use a lot, except in a court of law. And we said, well, the jurors heard the testimony of a witness today, and that testimony was solid and strong and hard for the prosecutor or the defense to refute. Did you know that you can go to jail? You, do you know that there are people in prison today, and, and, and many have been released, and falsely in prison just based on the testimony of some others? I mean, the, the DNA technology today has, has released several people who were accused of committing a crime that DNA proved later in the years that, that, that they weren't guilty. But they were only there, listen, because of the word of someone's testimony that they were the person. Isn't that interesting? So if it can work that way, and we know it does, right? How much, that just tells me how powerful a testimony is. And how about your testimony? Listen, nobody can take your testimony from you. And when you share your testimony, what is your testimony? It's just your story. When you share your story about what God has done in your life and how you were here, but you prayed and God did this, that's a powerful testimony, and it's your story, and it's your testimony, and nobody can refute it, and it's probably a lot more powerful than you can even imagine. And see, I know how it is, and I know how some of you are in this room. I really, I do. I don't mean this in a bad way, because I know many of you personally. Many of us, we don't want to be the spotlight. Like We don't want like that spotlight to be on us, and we're hesitant to share our testimony. A lot of times we'll take something that God did in our life, and, and we'll be grateful for it and thankful for it, but we really don't share it with others. Pastor Greg Kennedy, who passed away this year, who, who I really loved and was a real father to me, I heard him say often that your personal experience and your testimony might be personal, but it shouldn't be private. Although it may be personal, others need to hear about it. Blind man. I mean, he got things stirred up. Jesus, Jesus opened up his eyes. And he got called before the Sanhedrin and the religious Pharisees. And, 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 and he's saying, listen, y'all, all I know is, listen, I, I was blind, but now I can see. Well, what do you say about this? Well, what about the man? Says, I don't really know this man. His name is Jesus, and I've heard about him. I just know that I was blind, and now I can see. And he kept saying that over and over, amen? I mean, that, it don't have to be a big, drawn-out story. He just kept saying, I was blind, and now I can see. And he was born blind. Isn't that amazing? You know, I mean, and, and it's not like you're trying to corner people and share your testimony. That kind of freaks me out a little bit when people do that. But you know, what, you know what can happen? Listen, you know what can happen? We can be open when the Holy Spirit is moving and stirring and trying to use us. We can be open to be transparent and honest and open with people around us as God puts those moments together. Maybe you're not necessarily looking for them. Maybe you're not like, I'm going to look for five places to share my testimony today. You don't necessarily have to do that, but here's what you could do. Lord, I got a testimony that you gave me, and I'm willing to share it if you want me to, where you want me to. And all I'm asking you to do is if that's what you want me to do, you, you put me in the right place at the right time with the right person, and then, and then, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to open up my mouth and, and let you speak through me. Wow, that's powerful. I really, I personally think that's the way to do it. And I think with that prayer, listen, I think with that prayer, that's a prayer God will answer. You'll find yourself in more situations, a guy at work, a gal at work, or this situation or that, where God is using you to share something. And not to share everything. You don't have to feed, you don't have to, you don't have to give them everything all at once. But just what God gives you, you can share your story and your testimony. I like this. You know, like Peter was a star of the show right there, right? He could have gone in, had anything to eat in that house, and they could have set up all night just in that little group talking about how great God was. Boy, I tell you what, they were on this side and that side. He could have gone all night over that, right? But he shared that story, and then he went on somewhere else because he knew somebody else needed to hear about this. Isn't that amazing? 
Acts 1.8, I read that, right? Listen to this quote. I just found this quote this morning, and it had no author, but it said this. It says, your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison. Wow. Now, that was a quote. Someone wrote that. It's like, I just, I, I wasn't even Googling quotes. I don't even remember what, I was looking for a verse, and this quote just popped up. No author, no name. It says, your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison. You know why? You know why? You know how that happens? Because your story will give someone else hope. And here's how hope works. Lord, if you did it for Mike, then you can do that for me. Isn't that something? Lord, if you can do that for Jason, if you can do that for Courtney, if you can do that for Bob, if you can do that for Jeff, then, Lord, you can do that for me. Wow. Gives them hope. You know, in the worst places in the world, I don't know if it's one of it, it's probably the worst place in the world to be, is hopeless and without hope. Hope is an expectation that things are going to get better. Hope, particularly Bible hope, is an expectation that God is going to come through and show up on your behalf, even though situations and circumstances might look bleak. That's hope. And when people lose their hope, they do desperate things. Many have taken their lives because they just lost hope. It really didn't make sense, but in their mind, they lost hope. And that's what they did. You know, your story can give hope. As you share what God has done in your life. Isn't that amazing? And we've talked about all kinds of things here. Prayer, evangelism. But they work together, don't they? You and I can be walking, talking evangelists. And see, I really believe this. Listen, if that's our heart and our mind, God will use us. I'm telling you, he will use you. I'm like, if that's your prayer and you go to Walmart... Think about it in that moment. How many people in that Walmart at that moment have that prayer on their tongue? Lord, I'm ready for you to use me anytime, anywhere you want. If there's somebody hurting in that Walmart that needs a word or needs to hear a story of hope, the Lord, listen, don't be surprised if he don't just connect you with that person standing in line over there in the meats and the milk and sporting goods sections, getting your fishing lights. Who knows, right? But that's just how he works. And he'll do it over and over and over. And you know what? This is how the good news is expanded. What the enemy meant for evil in terms of killing James and imprisoning Peter, what the, meant, the enemy meant for evil, look, God turned it and flipped it on the devil and gave Peter a powerful story that he went about sharing everywhere he went. And we see it recorded right here in Acts chapter 12. Isn't that powerful? What's your story? You've got one. You've got one. And it's probably way more powerful than you believe. And it's probably most likely a story that somebody needs to hear. So what's our prayer, then, Lord? You know what? You do. And, it, 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 and it's just a process that repeats itself over and over. Listen, we get ourselves in a situation... We find this circumstance here. We pray. God delivers and does exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could think, ask, hope, and imagine. And then we share that good news and that story with someone. Isn't that interesting? And then that thing just repeats itself over and over and over. And that's really the truth. I was looking through an old journal the other day, and I saw some things I had written out. Or it, was a, it was a prayer list that I'd put together. And all the things in that prayer list was like four years ago, three years ago. Everything on that prayer list I could check off and say, yep, God did that. Oh, I remember how he did that. Oh, you know what? And he did that. And just one by one, I went through like, wow. But in that moment, those things were so burdensome to me as I was believing God for breakthrough in those areas. Isn't that awesome? Yesterday, my wife snapped a picture a few weeks ago of her and Jonas. And Jonas is growing so fast, obviously, at this age and stage. He's a week, he looks different than he did the previous week, right? But she snapped a picture, and she's got it on her phone as her screensaver phone, uh, picture. And I liked it so good, I said, hey, I want that on my phone. And so she 
she sent it to me, and, and then I had to get her to show me how to do it because I couldn't remember, right? It's been so long since I've done it. And so I got it up there on my screensaver. And for the first day or two, every time it popped up, I'm thinking it's her phone because I've seen her phone with this picture on it, right? But now I'm used to it. I know it's my phone, right? And I see this screensaver. I'm getting out of the car yesterday. Yesterday, I'm getting out of the car. I'd run some errands. I'd done something, and I'm getting out of the car, and I pick my phone up. And a lot of times, you just pick it up, and it'll light up on you, right? And that picture pops up. See, and if I go into it, it doesn't do it. But just, just right there on the screen, say, that picture pops up, right? And you know what that thought hit me? The moment I saw that picture, I got an immediate download. You know what hit me? Five years ago. What I got on my phone right now as a screensaver was the, pri the, the prayer and the cry of my heart just five years ago. Five years ago, I remember laying flat on my face. I was actually in a church by myself, laying on my face with a notepad beside me because I said, God, I need a word from you. I need you to speak to me right now. I need something that I can live on. And I just started writing things down and journaling what God was giving me. And he told me about this lady right here. You know what? At least two people actually told me what her name was, her first name. Mike Sharp was one of them. A guy in Raleigh was another one, a brother. Just was praying for me. He said, man, I, this name keeps coming up, and I believe, this is your, I believe that person is your wife. Had not even met her yet. That's deep, isn't it? And, and I, I mean, I got witnesses to prove it. <laughs> you know, it. It really happened. You know what? On that piece of paper, listen, I'm already the father of four. But I wrote on that paper that, that, that this is a word that I got, that I've got someone I'm sending in your life. And then I wrote down, and there's a, and there's a son in your future. I wrote that on just a yellow legal pad of paper. And I can remember having gone through that divorce and just, Knowing that that was not me, I, I was really believing God for that soulmate and that person that he had for me. And I remember just crying out to God, man. I mean, like nonstop. And, and for two or three of you here, I wore your phone out because I, I'm like, I would call my mom multiple times a day. Mom, give me a word. What's God saying? What's God saying about this? I need a word. I, I just needed hope. I needed hope. And I would pray and I would fast and I'd take communion right by myself in my kitchen. I lived in a, the second floor of a building right on Main Street. And I'd take communion a crack, and I'm believing God. I'm, I'm like, Lord, as the woman touched your, your, your garment and she was healed, that was her point of contact. Father, as I take this bread and this cup, I do it and I'm believing that I receive. I believe that I receive that wife that you have for me and that little baby that you have for me. And now he's on my, they're on my phone. And I, had, I wasn't thinking about just this, but just, look, you got to stop every now and then and say, wow, Lord, this is what you did. And it's exceedingly and abundantly above anything I could ask, think, hope, or imagine. And I wish that, I mean, I, I got more stories like that. There's, and you do too. You, you do too. There are other things that, 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 that God's done in your life that, that you, you've got your story too. And here's the beauty of it. Listen, when we find ourselves in a place that's adversarial, we find our place, ourselves in a place that feels hopeless or lonely or we feel lost or empty and there's something missing and we're believing God for breakthrough, we can pray. We can pray in faith. And even if our prayers aren't as full as faith, of faith as we know they should be, we can know that we have a Father in heaven that is gracious and He's merciful. And you know what I know about him? And he loves to answer prayer. He's generous. He loves to answer prayer. He loves to answer prayer. Amen. Listen, as parents, don't you just love pouring out blessings and goodness on your children? Of course you do, right? And we're just evil. We're just evil in nature. But our Heavenly Father, he loves giving good gifts to his children. He loves answering our prayer. Amen. I love this song too, good gracious. I love that line that says, if you're tired and you're thirsty, there's Jesus. Wow. Lift your eyes to heaven. Jesus. Amen. Just want to encourage you this morning. Things may be tough at times. Maybe there's a lot of uncertainty 
in your life. And I'd love to tell you it's about to end, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's coming next. But I just know that I have a heavenly father that I can trust and that will never lead us astray and that our prayers are powerful and he loves to answer those prayers. And when he does, we've got another story that we can tell and somebody needs to hear it. Amen. And then we repeat that process over and over and over. Amen. Hey, let me just say this this morning. Whatever you're standing in prayer for, I agree with you today. I agree with you today. I set my faith in agreement with you for the answer to that prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And I don't even know what it is. But I bet there's more in this room right here. I bet everybody would put their hand up right here, right now, and say, you know what, and I agree with you too. And we agree with one another in Jesus' name. Amen. And God is faithful. And he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask, think, hope, and imagine. Let's stand our feet this morning. I need a communion cup, Doug. I didn't get mine. Does anybody else need one? Anybody else need a communion cup? A couple right there. One over here. Praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So listen, this is our invitation this morning. Here's our invitation. Our invitation is this, and it's so simple. You ready? Our invitation is as simple as this. Just receive. Freely give and freely receive. This morning, our invitation is just to receive. Receive Jesus and his salvation for whatever area of your life that you need it today in Jesus' name. Be made whole in Jesus' name. Prayer be answered in Jesus' name. Breakthrough come in Jesus' name. Whatever you stand in need of today, through the body and the blood of Jesus, listen, as you consume it, as you take it down, let it go down your throat, into your stomach, listen, you believe that you receive today. In Jesus' name, what you need. Amen? And you watch what God does. Let's pray our prayer of faith. Father, we just thank you today for Jesus. Father, we thank you that he is the way maker. You, we thank you, Father, that you sent a way to us when there was no way. And his name is Jesus. And Father, we thank you. And we lift him high up today. High and lifted up in this place. High and lifted up in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. In Jesus' name, we lift you up, Jesus. We declare today that you are the Son of God, raised from the dead, died on the cross, raised from the dead, bore our sin, our iniquity, our shame, our reproach, our sickness, our disease, our poverty, our lack of peace. You took it all so that we could live this abundant life. And we receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I set my faith in agreement with prayers that are being prayed right now and answers that are needed. Father, we say breakthrough come now in Jesus' name. We say we believe that we receive what we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We declare breakthrough come in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for supernatural deliverance. Just like Peter experienced that supernatural breakthrough and deliverance, we declare that today over your people right now in Jesus' name. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Now receive that by faith.